Hello, and welcome back to the Cube's coverage here for Media Week in New York City. The Cube's East Coast studio at the New York Stock Exchange on the balcony overlooking the show floor. We're in the afternoon of day two of three days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage on Wall Street, you know, with the Cube connecting Silicon Valley from Palo Alto studio here to our new studio, creating a sub-network here and building a great community, the Cube, plus the NYSC Wired with Brian Bauman and, and, and Network. Really, it's just been a great uh, Founders Week here and the AI leaders on the East Coast. Cole Crawford is back. He is the founder and CEO of Vapor.io, an innovative company. Still a startup, technically multi-years in, but building out quite the incredible network edge system. Um, Cole, great uh, great to see you again. I saw the big news uh, about your Las Vegas. You had no news last time, but you were kind of teasing it out last time I was in town. Uh, great to have you on to unpack the news at Vapor. Lo lo yeah, thank you so much for having me back. And yeah, uh, yeah. exciting news for sure. Yeah. So first of all, let's do a recap on what you guys are doing. I think it's really compelling. You've been a multi-year journey building out what I consider probably one of the most um, well-architected edge networks. You know, I love uh, networking and low latency connectivity, especially as the age of computer vision and AI comes in and as moving vehicles to any kind of new way to get more data in off, off all types of content, vision in particular, computer vision and video is, going, is a hard problem and you need to have that network. So give a recap of what you guys are working on. Yeah, incredibly hard problem. And you know, I'll, I'll say it again, most internet companies tend to measure latency in like hundreds of milliseconds. We measure in hundreds of microseconds, right? And, and it's great to be on a show floor like this where you actually get down to nanosecond you know, trades um, via the matching engine. So cool, cool to be here talking about latency, yeah. but we, we do build an incredibly sophisticated last mile backbone made up of a combination of, you know, our own optical layer combined with, uh, say, uh, open ran 5G with partners like NVIDIA and, and uh, customers like the city of Las Vegas. You know, ICE, the parent company and the NYSE, they're no strangers for low latency trades. Obviously, they've been working the market for many years across many verticals of, of, of content and data. Um, latency kills. If you have low, low latency uh, applications that are required, any lag in the system is detrimental to the performance. Also, the results now that generate AI factors latency into the quality of data it can get. Um, this becomes really the, I think, the, I think a fatal flaw if you miss this. Explain the, rea the reality of why that's so important. I mean, everyone always talks about the laws of physics, and then Wall Street's no stranger to high frequency trading. They know you put the packets closer to the trade, you get an edge, but you know it's no longer how close you are to that packet. Packets are everywhere distributed. This is a huge point, and with Gen AI, it makes it more important. Explain your view on this. Yeah, so look, I mean, I think it, it's been great to listen to other founders and other uh, adopters of, of both Gen AI and inferencing, distributed inferencing, over the past couple of days. And you know, our, our take has always been that if you're going to build out any sort of solution that has some kind of distributed component to it, there's a lot of technical complexity that goes into that. There's a lot of architectural complexity that goes into the network design of that. And I mean, the reality is training relies on, at least NVIDIA training, <coughs> excuse me, is optimized for um, this backplane that includes uh, this, this physical cable uh, and InfiniBand connection that has distance constraints, right? You're, you're constrained to about 100 hundred meters um, in that in that solution. There are new technologies, as an example, Ultra Ethernet that is coming out where you now have some, you know, pretty cool RDMA capabilities built into uh, some of the some of the Ethernet kind of call it cross hall, if you will. And it's not maybe forward or backwards, but across a town or across a, a data center. And these are the challenges that that we've decided to take on and these are you know typically reserved for massive sort of hyperscale companies that have like near unlimited budgets <clears throat> but we are we're, we're, we're progressing uh, forward with customers like like city of Vegas where both a computer vision enabled 5g network is attached to an incredible middle mile backbone and through that you solve not just latency issues but you solve like the economic challenges so well, you know, what's the easy button for a highly distributed computer vision platform across a city? Is it putting, you know, call it upwards of 30 or $40 million of fiber optics to every smart pole where that camera is? Or do you build that on a low latency 5G network with 
you know, potentially a, a, a solar enabled battery f so that camera is getting its connectivity through a low latency 5G network and it's being powered, uh, you know, 24-7 uh, by, by, yeah. Yeah, and one of the things that I've been personally passionate about uh, in my role at the Cube is uh, educating people through our research advisory around how to deal with innovation strategies with the regulators looking over your shoulder. Um, I was recently at IBM and, you know, they're trying to figure out how to not stunt the innovation growth by having over-regulation before innovation kind of rears its value proposition. And it's happening now. So the advice I always say is go to areas where there's innovation. And, um, you know, everyone's working with some states and local governments. I got to say, and my advice to IBM at the time was, you know, do a consortium. That's always a good play. Bring multiple actors in. But get the innovation pace faster than regulation so that they're catching up, not dictating terms. Uh, and I bring this up mainly because the news caught my attention that the city of Las Vegas rolled out their new AI-enabled private network uh, facilitated by N NVIDIA hardware, which you guys are powering. And I used Las Vegas as an example because Las Vegas is probably one of the most innovative areas, Clark County in particular, of uh, doing things. They've had 5G before it was 5G. It was actually 5G you know, <laughs> evolution E, um, which is basically not 5G. But, but that's a good, you know, we're not going to ding them on that. <laughs> good to have 5G out first. But this is where they, they're using it as a way to really make it a petri dish of innovation. They're experimenting, but actually being pragmatic about it. City of Las Vegas is the place to go because they have real needs. They have unique environment, tons of security challenges. It's the mecca of all entertainment. F1's there. You got the stadiums there with the Raiders. You got all kinds of activity. You got casinos, money. Yep. Everyone wants to get that cash. Yep. Doors don't get locked in Vegas. I mean, it's open 24-7. Yep. So take us through this news that you have with Las Vegas, because I think that's, again, will tell us a little more about what you're doing, but more importantly, how your product adds value and uh, the, at the application layer. Sure. Uh, so first off, you got to hand it to the city of Las Vegas for being as innovative as they are. As you rightly point out, there's it is the sort of entertainment capital of the world. And, you know, every major conference sort of now happens there, at least at least yeah. it has some presence there uh, at some point in the year. Uh, from AWS reInvent to Mobile World Congress to CES, et cetera, right? So some of the largest events happen there. So security and, you know, from a from a AI-enabled sort of architecture and how you both technically think of implementing that and what it does for not just the city, but what it does for the, you know, the pedestrians and the retail experience and, and city services, um, the municipality itself, economic development. There's a ton that goes into the planning and execution of building a network like this. Um, and it really kind of depends on, you know, where you, where, like where you, where you sit in the, the value chain of that economic development. And, our, you know, our goal is always to help solve interesting and complicated last mile problems without sometimes like even, I don't, I don't want to say we don't care, but we may not know up front the specific challenge yeah. that the company's trying to solve or the city in this case is trying to solve for. So, you know, this deployment originally rolled out as, hey, we've got, we own our own smart poles, we've got some fiber, we need some connectivity, and we're building solutions for our citizens and our businesses and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, our, our, our hotels. And we're, we've, got, we've got new line of sight to things like cancer research and medical districts and art districts. And, it, you know, we've got these new investments that we are making as a city and we want to be tip of the spear. We want we want companies coming here. We want companies investing here. Yeah. And you know, Vapor was attracted to not just the innovation, but the 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 real world deployment, the desire to adopt these innovative yeah. capabilities and test them. Uh, to your point, it, increasing the pace of innovation is how you increase the pace of adoption. Yeah. What's interesting though is is that what I like about what you're working on is that you have and you were quoted in this article on Fierce Wireless, um, uh, uh, our, our Fierce Network, part of the Fierce Wireless group, I'll quote, I'll quote the um, thing. Um, you call the deployment a software programmable network that can run next-gen AI-centric workloads. Okay, because computer vision is a big app there, um, that is a hard ingestion problem. So programmable and having in this kind of plumbing challenges and then dealing that with a backhaul network and or edge last mile solution 
is just technically hard. Yep. And you're doing that, so check. But the people who would want to run the application, they don't really care. I mean, they do care. They want, they, they're want the customer. They just want their thing to work. Right. So in this case, identifying a missing child yep. or identifying someone who might be on a criminal or even just you know other cool computer-aided, computer vision-related AI, could it do a lot of things? It's the body cam yep. work. Yeah, going through with body cams in real time. And yeah, this is like our world now. This is our world. And in fact, people don't realize, and we don't compete with this company that I'm about to mention. Uh, pretty sure they're actually NYC listed. Uh, they are public, 90% sure NYC. Um, people don't realize there is a company that's been doing this for a long time, maybe not with AI, but I'm sure that's probably on the roadmap because if you're not looking at AI right now, I, you know, you got your computer vision, yeah. <laughs> especially computer vision. So there's a publicly traded company called Axon that does exactly this. I, like if you've looked at any sort of YouTube video on, on police body camera footage, it, lower left-hand corner probably says AXON on it. $33 billion publicly traded company. Sensors are what's going to drive AI. I, you know, I think la large language models are super interesting as like an interactive tool that we get to like test around as a, as a consumer of, of Gen AI. But really, I think, you know, similar to 5G, AI is, a, is an enterprise like the money is going to be made on the enterprise, not on the consumer. Yeah. Uh, and it's meant to solve hard problems. Like the things that AI can pattern match against versus what a human can pattern match against. Like well, we get bored, we get distracted, we have other things that we've got to do. And AI could just do that 24 by 7 and it's going to do a good job, right? Based on data in. Good data in equals good data out. Garbage in equals garbage yeah. out. Um, so we like the fact that you don't necessarily need sort of um, person in the loop looking at that video feed in order to detect a threat or detect a robbery or detect, you know, what a, a, a missing kid, uh, which that sort of mechanical Turk process has been the process for yeah. so long. And the idea isn't to disrupt jobs in Las Vegas. It's actually to open up more time for more people to do more innovative things. So the, the, you know, our, I don't want to say mundane, but the, the well, task. I mean, of, I've debunked. I've, I don't like this whole jobs going away. I've seen this, yeah. that cliche been thrown yeah. around on every generation. It's just, it's just wrong. In fact, the jobs are created on the other end 100%. exponentially because of the shift of no one likes wasting time on mundane tasks. hundred percent. In fact, it's, it's a morale killer. It, it is. And if your like, job is just to sit and look at a screen 24 by seven or review video footage 24 by seven, we now have computer vision that can do this. And so, uh, you know, I think that this is a good thing for, for everybody. And then, I mean, imagine the power of, and this is, this is ultimately for public safety, right? Like this, th yeah. these cameras aren't invading your privacy. They're out in public spaces where you're already being filmed. I mean, Las Vegas is one of the most, yeah. you know, filmed um, uh, public places you can walk around. And for, for good reason, it's, you know, it's been, it's grown very quickly. It's got an incredible amount of traffic. There's, you know, a lot of, you remember the barriers that were put up along the strip. It's, it, you know, there's a lot of partying that goes on in that city. And, it, you know, there's a lot of people that tend to like walk in front of cars, uh, you know, where there's no crosswalk. So, you know, there's, there's, there's been some challenges where the city is looking to optimize, like, how do you keep pedestrians safe? And how do you enable the, both the, the, inferencing side of that for predictive analytics versus how do you just determine the real time or or post situational awareness of what happened yeah. to either do reconstruction or yeah. to you know whatever it happens to I mean be. I think I think you're laying out obviously the, the common sense case for where the apps are assume that we all agree that we need those They've been unattainable in the past because Correct. of latency. Correct. I want to get into the announcement because I think this starts to show your hand with vapor. Um, I've seen the maps of, of your backbone, uh, very impressive. But now you now are enabling real applications. Uh -huh. This is, a, again, now the beginning of that. Take us through what this means for you guys. What's next? Obviously, programmable networks are key. That Gen AI is going to can write code. Um, everyone's going down to the kernel level of things to get better performance. In this case, you've got low latency edge. Yeah. You can always put more compute at these areas too. Yep. So, and then there's also a conversation around distributing yep. data and putting more compute at edge points and yep. managing data differently. Take us through for how the architecture will extend out. What is happening? What's going on? What is, how does Vapor continue to push that, that horizontal 
scale and also the ability to do these domain specific applications. Well, well, you mentioned, and rightly so, you know, latency is a contributing factor for the workloads that will or will not succeed at the edge. But the other challenge for the edge, which we had to learn the hard way, I mean, this was a hard, hard lesson for Vapor to learn, was putting just CPU out there also didn't really solve as much as it could have or yeah. will solve with GPU-assisted compute. So this accelerated compute, we see kind of what NVIDIA is doing here with you know, it's hybrid approach to things like Grace Hopper, where you have a 72 core ARM CPU attached to a H200 with high memory capability. So you got CPU, GPU on the same PCB sitting, you know, sharing a, a backplane capability. This is also equally important for how to take advantage of edge compute, where edge is not, you know, and we could sit here for two more hours talking about where the edge is, Forget it. Like, if you just think about what your latency profile... We'll schedule out for another time, but yeah, in this case, you then stay focused here. Like, let's, yeah, yeah let's, let's assume that some, some edges like NYSE are nanosecond, some edges like telco networks are microsecond, and some edges like general purpose cloud could be hundreds of milliseconds. Yeah. But the edge is also, it's not just a data velocity problem, it's a data provenance, a data sovereignty problem. Yes. And that is equally important to cities. Yeah. Clark County wants to keep data in Clark County, and rightfully so. Yeah. So... You know, do we have the same sort of GDPR style laws over here yet? We don't. Our privacy laws are out there, though. But they're out there, yeah. right? And yeah. you can expect that they will become more prevalent over time. So the you know the idea for well, just, for, just just a pause there for a second because I think you brought up this point about sovereignty and then the locality. This requires intelligence, okay? Super intelligence, if you will, not AGI. But and this is why you brought up Nvidia. And Nvidia is mentioned in your news story the role of NVIDIA with, with you guys. What is that role? And talk about this this intelligence uh, need because this is one of Jensen Wong's biggest things he talked about all of last year is that he's democratizing supercomputing yep. for the masses. Yep. And I'm all, I'm imagining that it's going to be smaller form factors. We, yes, we I mean, say the exact same thing. Like we we take hyperscale like architecture because we came, a lot of it came from hyperscale. Yeah. And like built open compute. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, ran the foundation and, you know, brought in Microsoft and Google and, yeah. you know, all of the people that were kind of the founding members of, of OCP. And we're, we're democratizing that hyperscale like cloud computing for these more localized vo data velocity, data provenance, data sovereignty based um, requirements. And, and you're right, like it takes intelligence. And again, the reason for the NVIDIA partnership is it's not just intelligence on the 5G front hall, like which virtual network function is going to spin up and down to solve like the eSIP reconnection for front hall. And sorry for being technical. <laughs> uh, so, you know, just assume that there's intelligence that goes into building telco networks, but it's also the intelligence of, hey, this is the network availability to me and, and not me, me, but the city or an enterprise. I need to geofence this traffic. I don't want this traffic leaving this boundary or I do want this traffic to traverse X, Y, and Z cities or regions, et cetera. So having a programmable network, right, that you can, you can architect to self-optimize and self-heal, that's the beauty of this. And you can do this over simple interfaces. You, it's all, you know, you had Arcus on um, yesterday and I think on yesterday. The, the beauty of that type of architecture yeah. is you can now build constraints into what the network is supposed to do in context of the application, and that's key. And we're in a super cycle right now. This is a key time for your venture. Um, what's this mean next? Does this scale? What's your plans? Uh, can you share? Is it too early to share? But this is already, I can see the direction. Connect the dots for us. Uh, look, I, I've, I've constantly been a contrarian to like the general consensus of internet evolution. <laughs> but but darn it, I've always been right. <laughs> um, I deployed the very first Linux box in a, a major telco in 1999, yeah. maybe 98. And everyone said... Yeah, and Linux, you, actually had to load a, you actually had to load the software on the machine. Totally. Back in the day. Yeah, I mean, yeah. with floppy drives. The young guys like, you loaded software on a machine? Not um, oh, yeah. Yeah, like, like yeah. Like, so, so what are you constrained about now? What do you think that you're right about? I think the the... Okay, so let's assume for a second that languages typically move slowly. I think the U.S. you know, language adds 15 words to the dictionary every year. That's not 
that's not a data velocity problem. There's a training issue there, right? But we've trained, I mean, I think even Sam Altman said, like we've trained 99% of the world, right? Like all of, all of the world's data, we've trained most of it. So what do you do? Well, if you want to keep training, there's a lot of the world that needs to continuously be trained. And that's all of the entropy that yeah. sort of happens out. Data gets generated at, at the edge. Right? You and I are edges and we yeah. generate entropy. And We're we at generate... smart edge right here, stock exchange. Exactly. Intersections are edges. Retail shops are edges. These, this is where data is created. This is where data should be analyzed. So there was an author, Jim Gray, fourth paradigm from Microsoft, yeah. said, don't bring storage to the compute. That's super inefficient. You've got to bring compute to where the data is. And the data is now in the yeah. real world. So if you want to, I think, you know, and, and I, I, I think through Gen AI and kind of the, the, the magic of yeah. what that can do as you interface as a human, yeah. But I, I think that that is extrapolated by like an order of magnitude yeah. when it becomes machine to machine. At this point, I think you're right about inference. You talk a lot about, you and I have talked many private companies about inference off camera uh, and on camera here. Um, AI inference is the killer app because you're right. I mean, the old school model was I have an application has data. The user could load data in and then they're consuming the data that they just put in or whatever. Yep. Um, and their data was easily out of band or not collected yeah. and they, or it's in their head. Yeah. Now the human or the edge is consuming data right. in the application, the generative application, right. but also throwing off data. So you now have a flywheel of data velocity in the interaction. Okay, so now you have now a net new data set. So the reasoning and inference comes in, the reinforced learning comes in. So you're starting to think, okay, now what's that paradigm? So now we move from I, I, I think of like the whole AI thing like school. I go to kindergarten, I graduate high school. That's training. Maybe college, put college in there. I, graduate. I don't go back to, I don't go back to fourth grade. I already learned fourth grade. I don't need to go back to fourth grade. Um, I then infer from that knowledge that I've been trained on. Right. I might go back for some classes to augment my current training. Right. So training will always be there, but not at the bulk of the, maybe the, the Gen 1 training. But as I learn new things that infer, I am updating my overall data set in my brain. This is reinforcement. Yeah. So this is the progression as edge devices throw off um, data. It could be telemetry data, it could be interaction data, it could be application to application, human in the loop, yeah. whatever that application and user is. Yeah. It could be machine or humans. Yeah. There's a new data set that emerges. I think this is where AI gets clever because now the edge could use the low latency, but also process faster. That's Jim right. Gray's point. Bring the compute to the edge. That's that's exactly right. And I, you look, you know, you can't help, but we all have sort of our cognitive biases. And the idea is, if you can reinforce AI with data-based biases that are quantitative and not qualitative, then it's just a really fantastic. No different than yeah, yeah. than a matching engine. It becomes algorithmic, and your biases are based on historical fact yeah. and not opinion. And that's what you want out of AI. So you're saying solve the bias problem downstream. Don't try to fix the bias. It's a, it's almost impossible to do it upstream. Well, yeah, yeah, because you're starting inherently with bias, right? Because whatever your bias is, it's biasing the algorithm exactly there. So you're saying as you get more data, collectively the intelligence of the super data set. And then it's not synthetic data either. It's real world data that is happening yeah. at the intersection, right? You, yeah. The person walks in front of a car, that was a true event. Yeah. And the algorithm can be taught that that was an actual true event. It wasn't some simulated yeah. uh, you know, multiple of pr predictive analytics. Yes. And that's why I believe that you're right on that because at one point, this is a really good insight is that the biases, no matter what they are, it could be, okay, it could be gender bias, that could be drawn by the application, it could be machine bias, what I'm looking for, yeah. things like misinformation in the media over time, whatever insights you can service to refresh the data relevance yes. drives the normalization of the data. So Th this, is where Ethernet, this is where Ultra Ethernet is gonna play a massive role in that distributed explain reinforced that. learning. So explain the Ultra e Ethernet impact. Again, just like if you're, if you're a city and you operate like we do, you know, multiple data centers around that city, and you've got an AI workload that is inferencing lots of things around that city, NVLink doesn't cut it. I can't make InfiniBand work between those two physical data centers that are like four kilometers or yeah. 10 kilometers away. Alter Ethernet gives me that Ethernet layer that sits one layer above our fiber optic layer, yeah. and it does allow for that reinforced training so that AI model 
it, uh, what, a, what a beautiful thing to have distributed training, distributed inferencing, distributed ingress for reinforced training, and then redeployment to that inference. Yeah. I mean, it is a, is a I, the positive Ethernet feedback. Thing also, I'd add to the Ethernet to, to feedback on that and say, Ethernet is open. So there's an ecosystem of vendors involved in Ethernet. That's correct. Interconnects are great for short distances. No one really cares what's under the covers. Does it work the way I, faster? Yeah, who cares? Infinite, great. But that's not the global scale. I mean, there's always a big fight between Infinite Band and Ethernet, uh, but it's not about one or the other. It's about how they're used. If I'm going to collect a bunch of clusters together, yeah, Infinite Band's great because I have high speed between the two systems that are working together to do something. All right, so where do you go from here? So let's 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 step back. You got the you got the deployment news is out there. You got the vision. What's on your radar? What's your plan? I mean, our our plan is to continue building these last mile networks that that matter for the large enterprise that has that supply chain issue that wants to automate that that next gen infrastructure, where some of the complexity is how do I solve for a a wide area network at scale? Because the reality is there's no one fiber company that has coast to coast fiber, like one can you know one contiguous cable that goes from one coast to the other. There's lots of local fiber from lots of local vendors. Putting that together so you can go to an enterprise and say, look, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what city you're in. Here's a layer two network that's available to you where you, are, you have the most optimal latency from lots of different vi providers that has been abstracted away and guaranteed you're going to have the SLA that you expect. Because as you know, John, internet's best effort, right? If you can now offer an SLA on the network, an SLA on the application, an SLA on the infrastructure, you're now talking about solving real world problems for large enterprises, which I think is everybody's growth engine, yeah. right? S does SNB move the needle yeah. for Gen AI? I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> it's, and do consumers move the needle for Gen AI? I don't, I don't think so. Yeah. It's large enterprise, that's where the opportunity lies. They themselves, everyone assumes that large enterprise has it all figured out. They're just going to do it themselves, but that's actually not true. Yeah. Large enterprises often need vendors to solve. I mean, if that were true, Goldman Sachs or a JP Morgan or a, you know, whoever would have no need to ever even build a financial cloud in Amazon. <laughs> They're big organizations with a lot of money. Yeah. So big organizations yeah. also need help solving complex challenges and when it comes to zoning and permitting, when it comes to running networks, when it comes to building accelerated GPU architecture, these are hard yeah. problems that we are we intend to just make easy at scale. Yeah, and the other thing that you're doing that I like is that you're taking that, what, uh, which is a construction-like mindset of getting footprint uh, and building a system architecture on top of it from day one, not just saying, okay, I got some location, now let's bolt Correct. on a machine, got a base station or whatever the telecom analogy would be, uh, great stuff. Cole, I really appreciate you coming on theCUBE with the news. Um, last 30 seconds, put a plug in for Vapor. What are you looking to do? Hire, plans, go. All, all of this, you know, the, there's a, again, a lot of complexity that goes into building these things. We actually call this whole thing zero gap because we've left out all the gaps, like from, from tooth to tail, Vapor has built yeah. one of the most capable backbones, both locally in market as well as nationally. And we've got some incredible alliances uh, we built with NVIDIA and hardware manufacturers, et cetera. And we've got some incredible channel partners. You know, we've been public about some of those, um, you know, do the, do the research on the web on yeah. who our partners <laughs> are and our channel partners. Um, but appreciate it, John. Thanks so much. Great to see you. Cole Crawford in the cube and NYC wired network. Obviously great to have him on. The networks are a really big part of it, of what's going on, not just the physical layer, but as it moves up the stack around data, and understanding the system's mindset and the system's architecture. Uh, a lot of trade-offs to be made. Latency is not one of them. This is going to be the future of Genevieve. I'm John Furrier here at our East Coast locations. This is our super node where we bring all the access from New York. We'll have a team here on the ground about building out the network. Of course, connecting that to Silicon Valley from Silicon Valley to Wall Street. Wall-to-wall -wall coverage. Thanks for watching.